What do you think we should do? the trailer. In 2006, Dr. Sue Savage Rumbar, Kanzi and the other Bonobos, as well as several key researchers, moved from Georgia State University to a private lab called the Great Ape Trust. Since the very beginning of the trust, Strong internal divergences led to significant difficulties for the apes, for Sue, and for the other members of her team. As Sue had finally recovered her leadership over the sanctuary in the end of 2012, she'd be suddenly expelled and banned from the lab, a little less than one year later, by the new directors, Jared and Bill, both former students of hers. This testimony concentrates on the dramatic events occurring in 2013. It describes their consequences on both people and apes, and it throws light on Sue's fight to recover access to her life work and to her Bonobo family. I had the lab and no money. Many of the people who had been working there could not be afforded. Mostly Liz and I were doing all of the cleaning and, and working and running the lab uh, for uh, six or eight months that it took us to really even get volunteers and, and train them. This person I hardly knew just appeared out of the blue from DC. He, he came back to Des Moines. He had known Lyle as a child. He had grown up next to Lyle's house had this suggestion that there should be two boards, not one IPLS board. There should be two boards and one board would solve all of the fundraising problems, all of the business problems, so Sue didn't have to do that. And the other board would just focus on the science. And Lyle thought that was a good idea, so he wanted to put in charge of one board and he asked all the scientists to resign and go on to the science board. Lyle had been our counsel. He had done everything possible within the city of Des Moines to try to help us raise money. And we were making a lot of progress on that situation with Lyle. I started having very close relationships with Harkin's office and Harkin's staff. And he brought Harkin to the lab. And everybody felt that we're going to get money from DC through his efforts and his close connections. And I had already, before came, I had already applied for to become a federal sanctuary where the money would go to Iowa. So nobody thought that really what he was doing was anything other than being overly aggressive in trying to bring money to Iowa. I had been working three years, essentially 24-7, really 24-7. I got a, a bladder infection and I... Uh, wanted to go to the doctor, but I couldn't get a day that Liz could stay late and still be with Tico and keep her extra, you know, work extra for me for like two weeks. I, I couldn't get her free to do that from her family obligations and her other obligations. So I got fairly ill. When she finally did it and I went to the doctor, I got a prescription and then I came back and I was there a couple of nights staying in Karen Tico and doing all the things I normally did, but I really didn't feel good. And so I got up one night and I, I unlocked one of those cabinets that I had the locks on all the time to keep Tico from getting into anything. And Tico was asleep and it was completely dark and I didn't want to turn the light on because I didn't want to wake him up. So I took two Excedrin and one antibiotic or something, you know, I took it and it, and it made me really lightheaded, dizzy. So I just laid down and went back to sleep. And when I woke up, I was really, really dizzy. And I couldn't, I couldn't stand up very well. 
And if I tried to stand up, everything would go white, like I was going to faint. So I just would sit back down. So Liz came and I said, Liz, I'm just really dizzy. I can't, I, I can't stand up. I can't walk. I, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. And she said, well, Sue, you can walk. You just need to get up and go lie down on the bed. I had laid down on the floor because I was afraid I was going to faint. And I was just trying to take care of Tico by not fainting until Liz got there and Tico was staying with me. So Liz said, I'll take Tico. You get up and you just walk to the bed. I said, I'll try, but I don't think I can do it. And she said, yes, you do it. I'll catch you. So I got up and I was like, everything was turning white. And she said, walk to the bed. And I took one step. And that's all I remember. I woke up in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And they said that because I had taken I, maybe some extra Excedrin, I'm not really sure, and the antibiotic that my blood pressure had dropped to 60 over 40, and, and they just needed to make sure my blood pressure was okay. So I was there all day, and they did an exam, and they said, yes, you have a concussion, but it doesn't, you, you might have a crack or something like that, but you don't have any major, major skull damage. It can take six months to get over it when your brain has been, you know, shaken like, like it's jello. So when I got back, I couldn't, I, I couldn't walk normally. I wasn't dizzy anymore, but my legs didn't work normally. And I was very concerned about that. And they said, go back to the lab. You know, we need you there at the lab. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't go back to the lab. Because I knew I would end up going in with the bonobos. And if, if I fell or something happened to me, uh, and Liz wasn't there, nobody would be able to walk in and get me. And everybody would think the bonobos had harmed me. You know, it could be very embarrassing. So I just didn't go back to the lab. And I explained to Liz, I, I couldn't go back to the lab. And everybody kept thinking I didn't want to go back to the lab because I could still talk and I seemed normal and I could walk very carefully. And they're like, you don't really care about the bonobos. Why aren't you going back to the lab? And I was trying to explain why I couldn't. I had a concussion. My balance wasn't right. I didn't feel right, you know, not the kind of keen edged right you need to have if you're going to be around adult bonobos. I, I wasn't in that place. So I was out of the lab from near the end of May until November when I came back. And I continued to improve. I continued to get better. As I continued to get better, they suggested that I should have somebody to work with me, to help me. And how could I say no? I mean, I wasn't even in the lab. And I knew that everybody was going to be worried about my age and worried about the, the future of the lab. And it seemed like a perfectly reasonable thing for them to ask me to bring somebody in to help me. The question is, who was I going to bring? I didn't even have any money, you know, and I, I was, I needed to be there trying to get the lab going again without the million dollars and without Ted's funding. So I, I said that I'm going to go and talk with Dwayne about what we should do. When I was asked to suggest somebody who might potentially at the in the future become a successor. And I knew I couldn't suggest Itai because he hadn't finished his PhD yet, but that was who I wanted to suggest. So I suggested Jared. Jared was the only male graduate student that, aside from Itai, that Dwayne felt he could recommend. So we started having these conversations with Jared and Jared was like, yes, he was already a member of the Bonobo Hope Board. I'll do that. I would like to do that. I, I don't know how much I can be away from Kennesaw. I don't know how much help I can be, but I will try. I'll try to work with Sue. It, it, it all sounded great. Uh, and we had many conversations with Jared over the phone, most of them Dwayne, but certainly some of them me. And Jared was never anything other than kind and, and helpful as far as, as far as I knew. And this information was conveyed to Laura and other people on the Bonobo Hope board. So after that, th that was about six months, I, I was getting my balance back. I was feeling much better. So I decided to go back and go in with the Bonobos. And it was my understanding that at some point, Jared and Bill would visit. I thought this might be over the next year. And that at some point, 
the Bonobo Hope Board would meet them and Lyle would meet them. And we would talk about working with them in the future. So I, I went back and I began working with the Bonobos again. And the staff was very happy to see me. But Tico had, had been injured. And that was the reason I went back. I was going to go back like in two weeks, but I went back earlier because my mother told me that Liz was about to die from exhaustion because she was staying day and night with Tico again and Tico had been injured. Liz hadn't told me that. My mom called and told me that. So then I found out that was true from Liz and I told everybody I felt better and I was coming back and I was going to relieve Liz and take Tico. I, I spent a lot of time with Tico when he started to get much better. And then once he got better, Liz revealed to me that she was scared to death because had said that 30 or 40 chimpanzees were coming to the lab and did I know it and I said well I didn't know 30 or 40 chimps were coming to the lab I thought Bill Hopkins might bring five or six at some point like I was a year two years uh, if, if Yerkes agreed to it Bill might bring some of the ones that he had long-term data on to the lab and they might stay in the Orang building I had had that discussion but I had had no discussion of 30 or 40 chimps and and i had no idea where she she said we won't know where to put them we're going to have to take care of them so we're going to have to take care of them we don't have enough people to take care of them we can't take care of 30 or 40 chimpanzees and she was just beside herself and i kept saying i don't really think that's going to happen and she was adamant that that i needed to do something about it and that it really was going to happen and i was back and i wasn't doing anything so i wrote a brief email to jared asking is this really true or 30 or 40 chimpanzees really coming? And as soon as I wrote that email, he was ordering me out of the lab. Lyle was very concerned. Lyle didn't come to the lab. He didn't know what was going on. Lyle encouraged me that maybe I should leave the lab and he would work things out. And I talked to Dwayne and Dwayne said, well, Lyle's promised to work things out. Maybe you should just leave and Lyle will work things out. So I got together a group of the staff that that were the volunteers and the people that I had trained and people that I had paid the salaries of. And I said, I'm being asked to leave the lab. I know I've just come back and I know Tico needs me, but I'm being asked to leave the lab and I don't really understand why, but I want you all to know that I, I want to stay here. I care about these bonobos. I agreed to leave, but I didn't leave because there was no one to come take care of Tico. Liz said she's too tired, she doesn't feel good, she can't come take care of Tico anymore. She had just stayed with him two weeks, day and night. And I'd been there only a week. And she needed more rest. So I'm like, fine, I, I feel fine. I can take care of Tico, I can stay. We just need to work all these things out. I don't know what they are. Then came in with, with a person she introduced as her boyfriend, a big muscled guy. And he was standing by the door and said, you have to go, Sue, you have to go now. And I said, but, but why? And I said, there's nobody to take care of Tico. And she said, ordered Liz in. And then Liz came in and she was all upset and she was all tired. And she turned and she said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? to Sue and the Bonobos and to Tico. Why are you doing this to Tico? I tried to give Tico to Liz and Tico threw himself on the floor in a huge, Liz called it an epileptic fit, in a huge rage. And he screamed and screamed and rolled over and over and slapped himself and slapped himself. And all the other Bonobos were crying. So rather than have a big fight, I just walked out of the lab and Liz tried to comfort Tico. That's how I got removed, and I've not really been back since. Just to clarify, it sounds like you didn't get to say goodbye to any. No, of them. you no. didn't to explain to them what was happening. No. They were all sitting there in the greenhouse watching everything. Qu quiet as a mouse at first, until Tico threw himself on the floor. Things went really downhill then after you returned from 
having been away for the concussion, it sounds like. And then in particular, when you tried to intervene with regard to the 30 or 40 chimps you had been told would be coming to the, to the sending that Sending that email sent through the roof. Was that because they expected to get money from these chimps? Or do you understand why, why that? Yes, since all of the many records have been revealed due to the uh, Zevchek subpoenaing Lyle and subpoenaing Lyle's records. And there are emails that state that Sue needs to resign in order for us to get the money from Yerkes. Yerkes is not going to fund the lab unless Sue resigns. In his 2015 ruling, the federal judge Walters states, quote, Yerkes wants to transfer the chimpanzees and there is money to pay facilities who will take them, a potential source of income for the sanctuary, as well as additional research, end quote. Judge Walters further states that in what used to be Exhibit 38 in this case, Yerkes sent a questionnaire asking if, quote, either Rambo was associated with the sanctuary in any way, concluding with the question, can you guarantee they will have no more involvement, end of quote. I had initiated a program to try to make the Iowa facility part of a federal sanctuary, which had, money had just come forth for that in 2013. And that money would be donated directly to, to Iowa or to the Iowa Primate Learning Sanctuary if we received it. The law was changed on October 31, which is right before I came back to the lab, so that the money that would have gone to, to places that applied to be sanctuaries, that money was funneled back into the primate centers, into the Yerkes Primate Center and the other primate centers. And once that money was funneled back into those primate centers, it would have given Yerkes the power to use that money to become the owner of a sanctuary in Iowa. So the implication is that possibly they thought you would disrupt the acquisition um, of the lab. They knew, by, they knew by your I would have disrupted and I would have disrupted it. You would have disrupted it and that would have disrupted the funding source. That would have but definitely disrupted the funding. And there were two boards at this point. There were two boards at this point, right. Okay, so then, then what happened uh, that kind of cemented your being Do you want Laurent to speak to that? The, the first thing to say is that the science board was not necessarily aware of many things happening in Des Moines. So we knew that Sue had left. We, I didn't know more than that. I didn't even know that there was a concussion, I think. That there was a health issue, but that's just what I knew. At the same time, I was trying also to arrange another visit myself. I was, and I think I was not the only one on the science board, I was interested in, in coming back to the lab and in seeing the bonobos and how they were. I was also curious of what was going on, to be honest. And I was not in touch with Sue. In that summer, we received a message from the council telling us that we should think about uh, appointing someone who would help Sue, who would, because Sue was doing all of the work herself and it was too much for her. And I completely agreed with that at the time. It was just too much for one person. And so we should bring another person who would be a scientist, but this other person would not be paid for the work. We changed about who could do something. I even said that I could help to some extent, but just to some extent. The point was clearly about appointing someone who would help Sue, not some, and who could later replace her, but not someone who would immediately replace her. Then uh, we didn't hear that Sue had come back. We received messages telling us that someone had been identified, and this someone was Jared, that Bill Hopkins, who was another former student, uh, 
had been selected by Jared to uh, be the director with him, and that we as scientists should vote on a resolution to appoint both of them. In the communications we, we received, we saw a message, very positive message coming from Sue about Jared. And at that point we had to vote. Jared was a member of that of that board, or at least that's what we thought at the point. Uh, there's a legality around it, but and it was making sense that someone from the board would step up. We had a good positive message from Sue telling us that he would be wonderful. And the resolution we had to vote on was written in, in a completely opaque way that was highly suspicious to me. Highly suspicious to me. And I had several times disagreed with people on the board on different issues as I always do. And this time I thought of sending a message to all saying, could there be a clarification about the exact wording? And I thought, Laurent, once again, you're, you're doing a bit too much, you're too suspicious. And so I ended up voting for this, um, for this resolution, even though I had important doubts on the wording. I didn't understand the consequences of the wording. I wouldn't have voted for it, of course. But the reasons why I didn't understand the consequences were uh, that we had the discussion in the summer that framed the, the, entire, um, the entire thing. And the discussion in the summer was not about replacing Sue immediately. And the other reason was that, and I'm not a native speaker of English, was that I thought, okay, maybe there is something I'm missing there. And the resolution should be clear enough for people who understand what is at stake. That might be the gesture I regret the most in my life, so I voted yes. Uh, that was a mistake. But I, we all voted yes. Uh, the paragraph that you were suspicious of and that turned out to be so problematic, uh, that was authorizing the replacement of the permanent re immediate replacement. Uh, what, no, what was it? It, it, it was more subtle than that. We, sh we should go back to the text. The, of course, there was no mention of replacing Sue. Uh, but the right. wording was ambiguous and was about having all power to etc that Dr. Talia Latella and Dr. Hopkins be authorized to structure whatever organization and make whatever reasonable business decisions that they deem necessary to develop. The interpretation that has been given to us after voting, not before the vote, was that we scientists and member of the science board, we voted uh, in favor of canceling any authority we could have over the science and the research. And we voted that only Jared and Bill uh, could do whatever they wanted with no oversight of any kind, including kick out Sue forever. And again, we didn't know that Sue was or temporarily suspended or expelled at the time. Even these interpretation, in my opinion, because I, I went back to the text more than once after that, especially when I was in court, but even that interpretation is suspicious to me. That is, the wording is ambiguous, but the maximal interpretation uh, according to which BHI abandoned all authority and all co-ownership of the Bonobos is completely suspicious. Unfortunately, in, in the federal court, there was no room apparently for discussing the motion and the interpretation of the motion because the judge said that he could not have an opinion about any of those documents. So nothing has been adjudicated on, on that level. But the interpretation is very, I mean, the maximal interpretation is very suspicious to me. However, the text in itself was fishy, clearly. Can you explain what happened with Liz? When did Liz get removed from the, from the lab? Well, Jared and Bill slowly made Liz's life increasingly difficult uh, by complaining that she would be there at night, by complaining that she was giving them too much food, 
there's just a string of complaints that they begin to raise, even though they weren't present. Uh, and Julie Gilmore was directing the lab in their absence. Uh, so Julie began to restrict Liz's hours. So Liz was allowed there less and less. And when she came, the bonobos were in greater and greater stress. Uh, and on the day that Matata passed away, Matata was, according to Liz, begging and begging and begging for water. And Liz was not allowed to go in and give her water. And Liz was not allowed to spend the night with her. And the next morning, people came in and found her deceased. They said that Matata was just old and was too bad, you know, et cetera. Uh, also, not only was Matata deceased, and Yoda couldn't walk. And he couldn't even walk to get anything to eat. And Liz was afraid he was going to die. She went in the cage against Jared's orders to sit with Yoda and feed Yoda just liquids to keep him alive. This was... I can't express how difficult this was for Liz. Matata, Liz, and I had raised all of the other apes. Matata, Liz, and I had been together, you know, every day since 1975. We, we were the matriarchs together of, uh, then with Pamanisha, the, the Pamanisha had already passed away by then. We, we were the stalwarts. All the males depended on us. And her passing was extraordinarily difficult for Liz. So was the passing of Pam Benicia and Nathan. For Liz to lose all of that, you know, it was like she dedicated her life. I mean, I had a professional life in addition. That was Liz's life. And, and it was, it was, it was unbelievably, unbearably difficult. And who did she lose it at the hands of Jared and Bill? students she had tried to help that really didn't were never nice to her when she was trying to help them because she didn't have a PhD. She wasn't going to school. She wasn't really important. She was a caretaker, you know, and she had to go through that. It was terrible. Uh, so the loss of Matata was in, it was unconsolable for the bonobos at that particular time because they were moving Liz out of the lab. They had already moved me out of the lab. The only female left was Alikia, and Alikia wasn't ready to be an adult female. She already had Deco, but she had Deco too early anyway. Liz finally just stopped going because she felt it was so hard if she was there to do anything with the bonobos. When she couldn't go in, she had to work with a mask and gloves. She had to work outside through the glass. They wouldn't let her talk to them. They didn't want her to use the keyboard. You know, it, it, it was just a kind of a slow, gradual thing. And she was also beginning to have more trouble with her, her brain, which, you know, she had had surgery uh, 13 years ago, and she was given three months to live. And she's always better after she was with the bonobos. And, and it was just very clear that they were able to help her. And, and she outlived any doctor's predictions, but she steadily went downhill from the time that they started restricting the contact. So they were restricting the contact. She was able to accomplish less. And she also began to not feel well. And it, it, it was just too much at one point for her to try to negotiate all of that. But then she realized, or she came to conclude that she, that she wasn't going to make it. And then she began to plead to be allowed to go back. And it, that, it was just deaf ear after deaf ear. How did she, in what form did she plead and what kind of responses did she get? She pleaded to me and I pleaded to Jared and Bill with the uh, assistance of the board. We wrote letters. And what happened with the letters? Nothing. No answer. No responses. So, so Liz died without ever having had any more contact with uh, any of them? She saw them in the cloud in the distance as she passed away. And she said, she said, there's a parade in Kanzi's 
Kanzi's playing the drum and, and Pam and Isha's carrying the tune. The whole situation was very, very difficult for Dwayne because he had recommended Jared. And at one point I was visiting him. He was in a nursing home. And uh, I explained that, you know, things weren't really working out very well and I, there was going to be no way for me to go to the lab and, and that it was even difficult to talk to anyone about it. You know, I was updating him. I explained to him, you know, the real difficulties we had and he had a stroke immediately and was never able to speak. I mean, it, it affected him. It affected everything in his life, even his death. And it affected everything in Liz, Liz's life, even her death. And, and how about you, Sue? What kind of attempts have you made to uh, contact them? The, the bonobos? Well, I've made steady attempts to, to res first were steady attempts to resolve what we thought might be or was billed as a miscommunication. And Laurent was very effective and sort of the leader in those attempts. And then we had this meeting where we were going to resolve everything and they were like, there's nothing to resolve. We own everything now. Didn't you know it? No. And, and so then Zevchik realized he would have to go into court. We thought we would win the battle. Uh, a lot of strange things happened in the court case. We did not win the battle. And so then uh, I, I all along wanted to go public, but we were advised not to do it. The case went on and on, it had to do with the judge uh, wanting to resolve the flooding issue. And that took another year to resolve the flooding issue. Uh, and then I was advised to get a lawyer and, and I got a lawyer and I've been working finding a way to right the ship and return since that day I was kicked out. I initially called Jared as soon as I learned that Bill Hopkins was no longer uh, an official part of the project and had moved from Georgia State to Texas. And Jared was very nice on the phone. Uh, we had a good conversation. Jared indicated that yes, the bonobos did have high level of language understanding, although he had denied that repeatedly in public ever since 2013. And he just said it's difficult to prove. Uh, Peter Gabriel gave me permission to invite Jared to the Interspecies Internet Conference and to pay his way, and Peter would make sure that happened. I invited Jared and I was very hopeful that Jared would come and that we could begin a resolution there. He didn't come to the conference, uh, but two people who were working from the lab did. And uh, I tried to talk with them and make a good relationship with them. I, Shane and myself and Sally and everyone else who went to the conference were shocked and startled at the tapes of the abilities they presented at the, the bonobos at the conference. I knew what had to be happening in the lab, so I wasn't shocked. I was just shocked that at the conference where Jared had been invited, that two people who worked in the lab came and gave papers under some kind of other auspices. And they, I was not even made aware. And then we all getting up at this conference and talking, it was a extremely awkward situation. For Jared, it's just too damn hard, okay? It's just difficult. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to think about. It's difficult to think through. It's difficult to deal with questions which you don't have the answer. And then on top of that, you have to get a relationship with apes. Well, that's really difficult. And if you try to get a relationship with apes, you might have to act like them. And if you act like them, people are gonna call you crazy. Lindsay said, well, Sue, why don't you just write and ask if you can visit the lab? 
So I wrote because I knew the answer would be no. And Jerry <laughs> wrote back and said, well, this is not a, a good time. So then I wrote and said, well, could you show them this video of me saying, hi, I miss you guys. Well, no, he couldn't do that. So then I wrote and said, could you just send this little lexagram letter and read it to Kanzi from Sue? He didn't even answer that. Well, I lost, you know, the bonobos. I lost for certain Matata and Pandanesha and Nathan and Pisgay from this world. And I lost all contact with all the others. And then I began to lose the people in my life. So I lost Dwayne and my mom and I lost Liz. And I never gave up uh, that there would be a way, that I would find a way. Uh, and many people told me to give up. Many people have told me it's too long. Many people have told me you'll never succeed. Uh, but in my heart, I never gave up. Sometimes I felt like I couldn't try anymore. I, I wasn't succeeding and I should just stop trying. But I never really gave up. It made me more committed that these individuals gave up their life, that I do what I can in my life to make sure that what they learned and what they taught us that that message gets across because it was that message for which they gave their lives. So I am uh, daily keenly aware of my job on the planet and I'm, I'm intending to do it.